Hey everyone, back again. Okay, today we're going to finish up Nora Erekat the Brilliance Justice for Some by covering chapters 4 and 5. Chapter 4 titled The Oslo Peace Process, and then chapter 5 to wrap it up and then the conclusion, but chapter 5 titled From Occupation to Warfare. Excuse any noise of passing loud cars. But before jumping into it, be sure to go check out the other episodes for what is probably the most succinctly comprehensive history of Israel's use of law to subjugate Palestine and the Palestinians. If you feel like if you're able to contribute, you can donate to one of the organizations listed below. Try to get involved with any of your local uh, groups. Show up to protests if you are able. Uh, that would be, that'd be really great. That'd be really great to mount pressure. But yeah, let's jump into chapter four here with the Oslo peace process. And then we'll go from there. Now, in 1987, there was a situation or an event in which an, an, Israeli, an Israeli driving a tractor trailer deliberately drove into two vans carrying Palestinian workers, killing four people. Palestinians began to protest the next day, and so Israeli forces killed uh, a protesting child, a 17-year-old, because this is a frequent phenomenon within Palestine where people protesting Israeli violence, protesting peacefully, are often met with more violence. Now these events launched what we introduced last time at the end, the first uprising, the first Palestinian Intifada, which was a student, worker, doctor, run, including so many other professions, run initiative by mostly Palestinians within Palestine, not run by the leaders who were in fleeing, had fled to Tunisia, uh, had previously been in Lebanon and actually scattered throughout the Palestinian diaspora in many of the neighboring Arab states. The Intifada was significant because it was a movement run by people, Palestinians within Palestine mostly. And they were everyday Palestinians fighting directly against their oppressors. Not, and not even really fighting. It was just a protest, really. They're uprising. Uh, it was nonviolent protest against their colonizers. Now, how did Israel respond? Of course, they responded with disproportionate violence. This is part of their handbook. In response, Israel's defense minister at the time, in 87, instructed soldiers who witness children throwing stones or throwing anything to break their bones, which is... Horrendous. And in 19, uh, 1989, uh, the United Nations found that 30,000 children needed medical treatment. The Intifada was successful, like in more or less successful in at least raising consciousness about Israel's violence against Palestinians. It essentially brought Israel and the U.S. to the table with Palestinians. It forced them to the table because the uprising was just so profoundly uh, effective. Of course, Israel would only permit limited self-rule and political economic rights for anything that they would actually be able to get at the bargaining table. But in any case, it showed the power of protest in forcing Israel to the table and to actually open dialogue with these people, with their, uh, the, with their oppressors. And so it seemed in the late 80s, that maybe some progress was going to be made, but then uh, things went awry in the early 90s with the Gulf War that saw, uh, that saw the U.S. reinscribe itself as the Middle Eastern police, essentially. The powerhouse in the Middle East that would use impunity to murder people use impunity to murder so many innocent people, and then this would actually be replicated uh, after 9-11 in the Iraq War then. The Gulf War also saw Israeli and U.S. ties strengthen because they very much relied on each other. The U.S. very much relies on Israel as a strategic ally within that part of the world. Now, with the U.S.'s increased power in the region, actually came some effort... We have to give George Bush Sr. the tiniest amount of credit here. He put pressure on Israel 
to stop expanding in the West Bank, which is a sign like Bush, Bush Sr. was better for the Palestinians than Joe Biden. Like there's no equation, like absolutely better for the Palestinians than Joe Biden, which should really put it into perspective how horrible Joe Biden has been. But Bush threatened to freeze money to Israel so long uh, if if, uh, it continued to expand into the West Bank to establish more colonies, more settlements in the West Bank. Now, the Gulf War was obviously, you know, a lot of different diplomatic ties here. Iraq had invaded Kuwait. Some states, obviously, more on the side of Kuwait, some more on the side of Iraq, U.S. on the side of Kuwait against Iraq. And so the U.S. largely to fulfill its own mandate as this police presence in the in that region had to create certain diplomatic ties with countries it may not have had such good ties with before, like Iran, Syria, Jordan, who were aligned in their opposition to Iraq, like Iran had just gotten out of its own war with Iraq uh, just a few years before then. And so there were a lot of diplomatic, you know... Quid pro quo type, helping each other out going on. And this actually prompted, as one of the U.S.'s ways to give back, at least ostensibly, was to organize the 1991 Middle Eastern Peace Conference to broker peace between Israel, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and ostensibly the Palestinians, even though they would be hardly represented. Palestinians could not attend autonomously. They were not given the option to actually attend as a representative body of their people. They could only join as part of a Jordanian-Palestinian delegation. That is all Israel and the U.S. would permit. Just another sign of the many ways in which the U.S.-Israeli alliance has systematically denied Palestinians the right to statehood that Israel then uses to say that they are not occupying them. Because in order for them to occupy the Palestinians, the Palestinians must be a state. So they're able to have their cake and eat it too. So these peace processes did not include Palestinian autonomy on the table at all. And so Israel could only stand to win, no matter the outcome. Like, it was obviously going to only give scraps to the Palestinians while it would write some nonsense in, the, in whatever negotiations they were putting forward about how Israel has more of a right to more area in the West Bank or has more of a right to set up more settlements or whatever while giving Palestinians the tiniest fraction of uh, power or of freedom, quote-unquote. So the PLO here missed a fundamental opportunity to leverage the legal work they had done in the 70s to mount an an international push against Israel. At this time, in the early 90s, the PLO's power was really starting to fade. So with the first intifada, like its power started to fade as we saw with the 1982 Lebanese-Israeli war conflict, where uh, the PLO was forced to Tunisia. So it was even more detached from Palestine and from the Palestinian people. This is obviously horrible. For PLO leadership, and by the 1990s, the early 90s, they, they the Palestinian people's faith in the PLO was pretty weak. That might be a bit of an exaggeration, more than it had been, it was weaker than it had been. But we'll return to these negotiations in a bit. But the other factor here that was contributing to the PLO's lack or loss of power over the Palestinians, or being a representative for the Palestinians, was the rise of Hamas in 1987. So Hamas emerged out of the Muslim Brotherhood, which had been around since before Israel even existed, I think in 1947. And it was based primarily, it focused on Islamic spirituality and revival. Hamas, in its early days, before it was Hamas, when it was just the Muslim Brotherhood, was not a liberation organization. It wasn't fully intent on emancipating Palestine. It was more interested in setting up holy sites, allowing people to pray, to go to a mosque, and so on. And it wasn't just Hamas either. There was the Palestinian Islamic Jihad and other organizations that had emerged 
more geared towards liberation in the 80s and early 90s that the PLO was moving away from. The PLO was seeking more and more so-called pragmatic solutions while other groups representing people, everyday people on the ground, were like, no, we have to do something right now. We have to do something right now because this diplomatic uh, approach is not working. Israel's just going to keep leveraging its power to manipulate the court, the international court, and to make sure that no matter what the international court recognizes or suggests that Israel do, Israel won't do it. So that's not going to work. People were losing faith in the PLO's effort to mount these political legal challenges to Israel. So Hamas was born, as I said, out of the Muslim Brotherhood, which was primarily, like I said, not really concerned with liberation or doing any kind of armed struggle or anything like that. But it came under fire in the, in the 80s and the 70s for its somewhat apathetic, apathetic stance, not being that interested in armed struggle or any kind of struggle, really, being primarily focused on spiritual revival. And one of the, one of the big figures from, uh, from the Islamic Jihad in Palestine was Fatih uh, Sakaki, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, Fatih Sakaki, uh, who really, uh, being part of the Islamic Jihad, who took, like, and he pushed the Muslim Brotherhood to become uh, an actual organization for liberation, not purely for spiritual revival. And so was born Hamas, which, which Hamas is an acronym for what I will pronounce probably quite poorly, Harakat al mukawama al Islamia, which is what Hamas stands for, at least the acronym, uh, which refers to or translates to the Islamic resistance movement. That is what Hamas means. And in its early days, it was very upset with the PLO and Fatah. Fatah that had previously been under Arafat's rule because Fatah had been come, becoming more centrist alongside the PLO. And so when Hamas emerged in Gaza in the late 80s, one of its first targets was Fatah that was working there as well as uh, political leaders. And so Hamas pretty much expelled them to the West Bank because Fatah was actually being uh, backed by the United States because the United States didn't want Hamas to have power back in the late 80s. This is part of their history of regime change and of proffering up their own puppet governments all across the Middle East, something that the U.S. loves to do. They tried to do that against Hamas in the late 80s and failed miserably. So eventually, uh, Fatah had to leave, had to leave Gaza as far as having political representation, political leadership there, and then went and joined the uh, PLO in the West Bank in the late 80s. So one of uh, Hamas's big criticisms was not only the general centrism, even though, I mean, I'm using that term very loosely here. I just mean that the PLO was relying heavily on diplomatic and political strategies, which Hamas was not interested in, in doing. Uh, and I think for good reason. I mean, look at the history. It, it hasn't yielded very much. But the other thing was that Hamas was not totally fond of the PLO's secular stance and Arafat's dream of a secular one state. That, that for Hamas, that was not going to fly. They're an Islamic resistance group. They were born out of the Muslim Brotherhood that was intent on spiritual revival. Hamas was not like totally intent, though, on cutting all ties with the PLO and the Palestinian National Committee. Uh, the Palestinian National Council, sorry. Uh, because they actually tried to join them in the West Bank. Hamas tried to join them for exchange for like 40% of the seats in in their uh, in their government, but they were, were could only be offered like ten or something like that. Not enough, and so Hamas was like, "No, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna ha just occupy some minority position within your political framework where we won't be able to actually mount any kind of meaningful pressure." And so they took command of Gaza, which is obviously separated from the West Bank, and were able to then essentially control their own political objectives and their own military objectives the way that they wanted to from there. Okay, so this was all a digression through the formation of Hamas, its creation, 
Now we go back to the Middle Eastern Peace Conference, where the PLO was not present, right? The Palestinians weren't allowed to have their proper political representatives there. Instead, they could only have this Jordanian-Palestinian split delegation to represent Palestinians, which is obviously like diluting the Palestinian viewpoint quite a bit. In any case, the delegation, the Jordanian-Palestinian delegation, was steadfast. It was firm in its perspective. It was firm in what it wanted. So I know that the way I've been framing the PLO for the last like 10 minutes has been like, oh, this centrist organization. I, I really want to emphasize I'm using that term very loosely. They were still mounting armed resistance. They were still fighting for a free Palestine. This was all part of their mandate. It's just they were more willing to go to the table with Israel than Hamas would have been. And at the Middle Eastern Peace Conference, this Jordanian-Palestinian delegation echoed their desires that they've had forever for autonomy, for the end of Israel's settlements, and Israel's military rule. Rule. They also requested that the Israeli National Water Company give up control over water in the West Bank, which, bet you didn't know about that, just the... They don't even control their own water. It's unbelievable. It's unreal. Uh, they also requested access to Israeli budget relating to settlements because they wanted to know and to start procuring and putting together evidence about how much money Israel was dumping into creating these illegal settlements in the West Bank. Now, in the 90s, in the early 90s, Israel was under a center left wing government, like by the guy, a guy named Radin. Oh, sorry, Rabin, R-A-B-I-N, who's a leader for the Labour Party. And this guy, totally, absolutely okay with settlements. And I mean, this is just more evidence of the way in which Zionism is not uh, a partisan issue. It's endemic to Israeli political life. Doesn't matter which party is in power. So even under this relatively left-wing government, they were, they denied uh, they denied Palestinian requests to halt Israeli expansion in the West Bank. And in response to the settlement freeze, Israel requested 2,000 settlements to account for what they called natural growth, as though it was just an inevitability, as though they were just this like virus, this parasite within the West Bank that has to be given some kind of breathing room lest the people there will suffer. Like, what is what? Now, during these negotiations, we saw, we saw, <laughs> I didn't see it, uh, I wasn't even alive. Uh, during these negotiations, the PLO made a ton of mistakes. So the PLO were sitting on the sidelines, right? They did not, they were not actually there. They were sitting on the sidelines and they were not happy about it. And they were not happy with the delegation making decisions without the PLO being present. And the PLO also feared that they would lose even more significance if this delegation was able to make any progress, because that would look quite bad on the PLO if suddenly this Jordanian-Palestinian delegation is doing things, accomplishing things that the PLO is not able to accomplish. And so they, they mounted this horrible, like, um, not really a campaign, but they were essentially opening up these back channels with the U.S. and Israel saying like, oh, the people at the table, they're this Palestinian Jordanian organization, a delegation, they're, uh, they're going to be really firm. You know, you're not going to get them to budge. We are much more reasonable. The PLO, you should talk with us. We're going to actually participate with you. We're going to make things happen. Those people over there, they're stubborn. They're not going to, you're not going to get anywhere with them. So the PLO was, was prepared to accept nearly any offer that would marginally help the Palestinian cause while, uh, and then there was the PNC, so the Palestinian National Council, they were right, rightfully feared any such capitulation. They feared what the PLO was doing in being prepared to accommodate Israel and the U.S. Now simply though, I mean, the, the delegation they had a clear objective in mind. They wanted Resolution 242 upheld. Resolution 242, remember, was the one where there was that translation issue that referred to, that demanded Israel remove its troops, 
from occupied territories, which would be significant. It would mean the removal of troops from the West Bank. But because Israel leaned on the English version that left out the definite, definite article of the word the, then that meant that they could interpret Resolution 242 as just referring to any occupied territory. It's referring to any, um, not any troops, any occupied territory and any conflict that was referring to occupied territory. And so it was totally unclear, which they took advantage of. And that's really, that, that was what the delegation was after. Now, Hamas posed their own challenges to the delegation as well. In, uh, in the early 90s, they abducted an Israeli police officer. This was in 92. They update, uh, abducted an Israeli police officer to trade for Sheikh Yassin, a Palestinian organizer who uh, had been held hostage by Israel. Now, in response, Israel detained 400 Palestinian members of Hamas and other political organizations. They were part, uh, part of the Islamic Jihad. They cap Israel captured 400 political leaders in Palestine, arrested them, and brought them to Lebanon and just let them go. Did they stop there? No. They also detained 2,000 civilians in response. Like, unfathomable numbers. Unfathomable. And the, the international community condemned this. Even the United States was like, yo, Israel, you can't do that. Like, that is so messed up. Uh, but this is the history of the U.S.'s condemnations of Israel. They say, oh, don't do that. And then Israel just keeps doing it. And the U.S. keeps saying, oh, don't do that. Now, in response to Israel's disproportionate response to the hostage, uh, Hamas is taking that police officer hostage, uh, the delegation suspended talks. The delegation was like, "This we can't keep this going if you're going to illegally detain thousands of Palestinians for, who've done nothing wrong, and many of whom you're taking to another country. You're essentially deporting them from their own country, breaking so many international laws. So Hamas's actions, though, helped gain or garner media attention for the first time in one of the really first mediated ways in Palestine to draw attention to Palestinian suffering under occupation. Now, when Israel refused to actually cooperate with Hamas, Hamas executed that police officer. And this got Israel really into the spotlight for its use of what is called the Hannibal Directive. Now in Israel, they use what's called the Hannibal Directive. The Hannibal Directive essentially goes that Israel will kill... No, sorry. Technically, that's not the language. The Hannibal Directive states that Israel will risk injuring, wounding their own people in an all-out response to any hostage taking by Palestinians. So if Palestinians kidnap or abduct anybody from Israel... Israel may use the Hannibal Directive that says that they are going to use extreme force to try and kill the hostage takers, even if it means committing harms to their own people, which more and more evidence is suggesting has was used on October 7th. But there is, I don't think anything has been made uh, definitive about that yet. There's just the clear acknowledgement that some of the victims on October 7th were killed by Israel's military. A small fraction of the civilian population of the 700 or so civilians killed by uh, Hamas, a, some fraction of it were actually killed by the Israeli military. We don't know how, man, how many were. We don't have the exact numbers, partly because Israel is refusing the United Nations to conduct any kind of meaningful investigation on the ground there. So these numbers are just totally, no, nobody knows absolutely for sure. The number of civilians killed was, total killed was 1,139, give or take. The number of uh, civilians within Israel killed was 780 something. And then the number, and then there were a couple of hundred taken as hostages. But this reveals another big problem with Israel is that it often appoints itself to conduct investigations against itself. 
So in cases where Palestinians are victimized by Israeli violence, or when non, not even Palestinians, when United Nations workers, when people from World Health Kitchen are brutally murdered by Israel, Israel is then like, oh, well, we'll we will investigate. Excuse me. Last I checked, murderers don't get to investigate themselves. That would be extremely absurd if we permitted any other country to do that. Like, can you imagine if the U.S. would let Iran or Russia do that? If Russia murdered a bunch of Ukrainians and then was like, we will investigate. You think the U.S. would be like, yeah, that's normal. That's definitely part of the normal procedures. We, we love this. This is great. And hey, I'm just into transparency, rationality, and truth. That's all I'm going for here. And so we have to apply the same standard everywhere. This is the key to rationality, people. So anyways, back to these discussions. Back to this delegation that had suspended talks because of Israel's disproportionate response to Hamas. Now, by this time, the PLO had earned Israel and the U.S.'s ears, had earned the opportunity to hold secret talks with Israel and the U.S., and they did so in Norway, and hence the Oslo Peace Accords. And eventually it would be moved to Washington, and its intent was to essentially set up the conditions for a two-state solution, which, what you know, on paper, you, or you might hear that and be like, oh, well, that's good, right? But of course it was going to happen entirely by satisfying Israel's conditions. Doesn't matter uh, it, w what was going to be recognized on paper. Israel was going to keep setting up settlements all throughout the West Bank. So the PLO proceeded to fail miserably in its talks with, um, with Israel in Norway. The secret talks in Norway while the delegation, the Palestinian-Jordanian delegation, was suspended had suspended itself, those talks with Israel, because of Israel's violence. Now, the, so the delegation, when they finally caught wind of this, that the PLO was holding these secret conversations, they were like, they, they found out what the PLO was willing to accept, and they flat out said, they're like, the PLO is falling for all of Israel's tricks. The PLO is just submitting to Israel and to all of Israel's conditions. So, the PLO gave up on Resolution 242 about occupied forces in occupied territory or forces in occupied territory. And the PLO had given up on reclaiming all of the West Bank. Essentially, the PLO was like, oh, yeah, those settlements are fine, which nobody among the delegation, the PNC or Hamas, definitely were at all interested in accepting. But eventually, the Palestinian delegation did return to the table with Israel, and just to highlight, like, their commitment, it's a minor thing, but they insisted that on any written document, when the word territory emerged, it be preceded by the word occupied, or occupied territory, or the occupation, never just referring to Palestinian territory, because if they did that, it would imply that whatever was currently recognized as Palestinian territory at the time, in the early 90s, would count as Palestinian territory. So it would, it would essentially mean that unless they uh, qualified it with the term occupation, all that land that has been captured by Israel would be theirs, would be Israel's, not the Palestinians, even though it was rightfully theirs. It still, it still is rightfully theirs. Now the uh, PLO's secret talks that had eventually moved into Oslo by now, from Norway into Oslo, or at least that's how it's specified in the book. I think that the conversations were happening more abstractly, and then there was a designated recognition of the Oslo peace process happening in Oslo in 1993. So they became more official when they when they moved to Oslo. And one of the PLO's first victories here, because they weren't it was it was it wasn't totally fruitless. One of their first victories there was the reclamation of Jericho that Israel had converted for security purposes. Because Jericho is very strategic. If you're looking at a map of Palestine, you see Jerusalem there. Uh, a little bit east, you'll hit Jericho right on the border with Jordan. So for Israel, this is an extremely important strategic city. So, uh, I mean, the PLO was successful at getting Israel to pull its troops from Jericho. 
But ultimately, the Oslo process, it left so much up in the air, which is all in Israel's favor. It left up, like, checkpoints, the existence of checkpoints, which is, for me, enough to know just how unjust the situation is. You don't even have to factor the history of Israel's disproportionate responses, their disproportionate use of violence, the repeated victimization of Palestinian civilians. Like, the existence of checkpoints is already just so... It, it doesn't make sense to me. But that was left up in the air alongside settlements and is, Israeli withdrawal from that territory. Occupied territory. Ah, don't fall for their tricks, David. But it did earn the PLO recognition as, I quote, a national liberation movement without any guarantee of independence. So, a little good, a little bad. But really, a lot of bad. As Erekat the Brilliant lays out, ultimately the final document, in her words, paved the way for the de facto legitimacy of Israel's settlement enterprise. Because the PLO was not nearly as hard about the settlements as they should have been. Israel would retain control over the territories, the occupied territories and settlements, and be, and be responsible for adjudicating any crimes involving Israelis, where they just investigate themselves. Palestinians cannot prosecute Israelis. Moreover, the PLO agreed to amend its charter to remove its equation of Zionism with racism and its commitment to armed struggle, which Hamas was absolutely not on board with, uh, and rightfully so. I mean, for an occupied people, armed struggle is one of their only ways to mount any kind of resistance. And I find it so funny when Americans lose their minds about that, uh, especially the ones who love, love their guns. And they're like, well, if someone steps on my property, I have the right to kill them. Uh, but in this case, no, armed struggle is absolutely not, it's not acceptable. But maybe none of those people exist. Maybe I just made that up. You, you tell me. You know anyone like that? Any hardcore Zionist uh, big gun people in the U.S.? I bet there are a few. And the PLO's actions didn't earn them any favors among Palestinians, even within the PLO. Mahmoud Darwish, the brilliant Palestinian writer, poet, thinker, he resigned from the PLO Executive Committee and others. Edward Said wrote many letters who implored the PLO to rethink its approach. They were essentially capitulating. They were surrendering to Israel. The PLO thought it was their only option as it affirmed their political power over pa Palestine and allowed 9,000 Palestinians to return from Tunisia, Lebanon, and elsewhere who had been in the PLO and had been in exile. Which is, this is all great for the PLO. Not so great for Palestinians. But all of this should really encourage us to ask, like, is it the responsibility of an occupied people to negotiate with their occupier? Like, that doesn't make sense. That's so unfair. Like, that you, you're just meeting two absolutely unequal power dynamics coming together, producing an unequal power dynamic, where one side is going to prevail because it has the U.S. on its side. Like, what? that is so unjust. So the PLO's dream, Arafat's dream, though, because there was a little bit of a plan here, they wanted to still keep the resistance project going, but they wanted a way to return to Palestine so they weren't doing their work in exile in Tunisia and Lebanon or wherever. So, like, th this was their hope, was that, okay, they make some concessions to Israel, they return to Palestine, they can bring a lot of their army back to Palestine, and then they can get the resistive, the resistive, the resistive, they can start uh, really bringing their troops together and their resources and everything to start mounting more resistance. Of course, this was really unsuccessful. This didn't happen the way that Arafat wanted to. It was ultimately, like I said, it was great for, the, great for the PLO as a party, not so great for Palestinians. In 1995, the Oslo Agreement of 1993 was revisited with the same garbage results for Palestinians. It would divide the West Bank into three territories. Territory A, Territory B, and Territory C. So Palestinians would, re would hold control over Territory A. Territory A would be around pretty much would comprise pretty much every major city within the West Bank. So Nablus, Hebron, 
Bethlehem, Jericho, uh, Janin, Janin. In any case, they would retain control of just those areas around uh, cities, which comprises maybe, they had maybe 15% of the whole West Bank was under their actual control. And then there was segment B or area B, which covered uh, like large swaths of land pretty much between each city. If you look at it from north to south, like traveling from the northernmost city in Janin, uh, like down to Nablus, and then between Nablus and Ramallah is primarily uh, designated for area B. And area B would be held under both Palestinian and Israeli control, which was primarily just Israeli control. And then there was Area C that would be commanded by only Israel. Israel would only command Area C entirely, and that comprised 60% of the entire West Bank was put under Israeli military control. Now, ask your Zionist friends. How many of them would be totally cool with that happening in whatever country they are in if 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 an invading army was just suddenly occupying 60% of the territory and you had to go through checkpoints to go to the grocery store to, to go from city to city. How many of them would be cool with that? It just, I, I would love to know. Now, was Israel happy with this? What was clearly a better deal for them and that just in, continued a legacy of Israeli violence against Palestine and against Palestinians? Were the Israelis happy with this? No. They absolutely were not, because remember, this was done under a center-left government. And so Israel would then begin appointing the most right-wing extremists in their, in their history for the next few years, all the way up to Netanyahu. And it, people were so unhappy that in 1995, an Israeli right-wing terrorist assassinated the, the, their own prime minister, assassinated him, because he was, was unhappy with the way in which he dealt with the Palestinians, because they wanted more. They wanted more Palestinian territory. And I said a bunch of right-wing governments took over. I mean, those kind of, you know, kind of went back and forth. In uh, 2000, around 2000, Netanyahu held held office, I think, for the first time. And then uh, he was defeated by uh, by a Barack, by Barack, who was, uh, t- you know, kind of a left-wing person. But it doesn't matter. It's not a political issue. It's not a partisan issue. Because under both Netanyahu at the time and then Barak, they had both doubled the number of settlements in the West Bank, showing that there is no like political option in Israel when it comes to ameliorating and ending Palestinian suffering. And before then, before that Israeli terrorist murdered their own prime minister, in 1994, an Israeli terrorist murdered 29 Palestinians at a mosque. 29 in 1994 and this it's unbelievable it's unreal in response hamas conducted its first suicide bombing in 1994 its first one and that's all you hear about of course that's all you hear about i get it riddled in all my comments uh what about the suicide bombing what about the hostages what about this what about that and it's like well i mean that's all very tragic i don't want to deminimize deminimize i don't want to minimize that But it's very interesting the way in which the same people probably said virtually nothing about this or how in 2008 Israel killed 1,400 people. We're going to talk about that. How in 2014 Israel killed another few thousand Palestinians. No, And then silence from all these people, of course. Silence. Because to them, Israeli lives mean more than Palestinian lives. So Hamas, in response to this terrorist murdering 29 people, killed eight, uh, killed eight in Israel. Now, after this, Israel would begin intensifying its military presence in Gaza and the West Bank. It would set up more and more settlements and increase the number of checkpoints and their control over Palestinian territory. Now, in 2000, in response to an Israeli invasion of Haram al-Sharif, Palestinians launched their second intifada, to which Israel proceeded to further brutalize them. And that's when the next intifada took place in in the year 2000. And that puts us here into chapter 5. From Occupation to Warfare, 
So the second intifada took o began in the year 2000, and it was mostly a youth-run opposition to Israel and the rusty old PLO. After six weeks, Israel had murdered 170 Palestinians, and there had been 10 dead Israelis. You see my use of the passive voice there? Like how CNN likes to do with when talking about Palestinians? Ah, I can use some double-think, sophistical, rhetorical trickery as well. Now at this point, this is the year 2000, Palestinians were not using gunfire, suicide attacks, and rocket fire broadly, like at all. They had like a single plane. They could, the, their military capabilities were very low. This was mostly, the vast majority of it was a nonviolent movement, nonviolent protest against Israel's occupation. And this isn't, this isn't surprising because that's all that they had at their disposal. Whereas Israel was just launching bombs at them daily and bombarding them for years. And they had been before that. But you hear all about, you know, Hamas's rockets, Hezbollah's rockets over and over and over again. There hasn't been the same kind of historical attention to Israel's rockets murdering children in Palestine. And not surprising, Israel has had no problem murdering civilians and political leaders for decades. Now, before the year 2000, quote-unquote terrorists were to be treated in criminal court. It was only around the year 2000 that Israel used the legal system to allow them to put forward the idea for the, that they, to make it allowed so that they could murder those suspected of being terrorists without sending them to court or trial or anything. And this would begin... We wouldn't be far at long after this that we start hearing about this nonsense about human shields. They could do this, start just murdering people without court, without trial, without anything. They could do this by denying their being in a quote-unquote civil war or a non-international armed conflict because these things would have demanded the recognition of states and instead claiming that they were what they called, and this is, I mean, that there would be anybody on this planet that would side with this reasoning, it blows my mind. But they argued that they weren't in a civil war or anything. They were instead in an armed conflict short of a war, which is just their clever way of saying, or never actually arriving at the status of a war, which would have given, uh, which would have given the PLO, given the Palestinians, recognize them as a political authority. They were then caught in this arrested development state of an almost war, this liminal state. Liminal, that's a fancy word, this in-between, this undecidable state of a, an almost war. And this is clever, and it goes back to Israel's strategy of denying Palestinians the right of recognition while also not giving them the same, so as a, in order to avoid giving them the kind of protections that would be required if they, if Israel recognized that they were occupying them. So Palestinians being in this liminal state are neither given any of the protections of being occupied nor given the status of being an autonomous, self, uh, you know, governing body at all. And they are also able to, at this time, by using this designation and denying Palestinian right to armed struggle, they deny the Palestinians any opportunity to actually use any kind of force. So to legally justify slaughtering Palestinians, Israel used the good old sui generis trick again. That is, that's the case where they say, oh, well, this is a situation like no other. So jurisprudence, so uh, previous cases, whatever the term for that is, precedent, uh, doesn't, doesn't count here because this is a totally new thing. That is, we're dealing with this new thing called the terrorist. We've never seen this before in history. So no law really applies. We can just, we have to just deal with these people. They're branded as this parasite, as this cancer within Palestine that must be eradicated. Or how the UN has now designated it, as Israel has done since October 7th, they have enacted, they have conducted an extermination. They even went so far as to legalize assassinations under what they call the assassination policy where they put into law that they could murder people preventatively, which is already very, 
it's a very scary prospect because Israel can then say or can murder people and say, oh, well, it was preemptive or it was in the name of self-defense. And no one holds them accountable to actually show evidence that what they had done. I'm not saying that there's any case in which murdering someone before they do something wrong is ever permissible, but they aren't even held accountable to prove that what they said was true. So they just murder political leaders and say, oh, well, they were terrorists. So therefore, it's okay. And so the UN can't do anything. Other states can't do anything because Jordan's not going to get into a fight with Israel because they know that the U.S. is going to just run its military right through it. Egypt was already cozy, cozy with Israel and the U.S. Lebanon is still trying to do its thing, uh, trying to oppose Israel. But I mean, its forces are probably no match for Israel and the U.S., Yemen as well. I mean, because the U.S. has way more military force than any country on this earth should possess, which should encourage us also to be considering about denuclearization, demilitarization globally, because there's no, there's, this isn't the world we should be living in. And so many other things, like just statehood in general, all of these things. Now, even the U.S. condemned Israel's assassination policy, again, this condemnation that they don't, they don't follow up on it or anything. They also opposed Israel's labeling its slaughter as a quote-unquote almost war. But none of this stopped Israel. In 2001, it murdered two Hamas leaders along with four civilians. Total international crime, right? You cannot, this is unbelievable. Again, the U.S. condemned it, but that did, you know, did nothing. And then, this is 2001. What else happened in 2001? We get 9-11. And after 9-11, the U.S. began to change its tune, and the U.S. began to adopt its own campaign of preemptive slaughter. And then when asked about it, uh, the spokesperson for the president for Bush at the time was like, yeah, uh, this is a different situation than we're seeing in Israel, so that's why we, you know, kind of very gently condemn Israel while we do the exact same thing. And then when Obama took office, he appealed to Israel's legal justifications or arguments, their previous court cases, to justify his zealous use, his extreme use of drone strikes. Drone strikes being uh, Israel's, Israel's, Obama's weapon of choice. And then, of course, there was the Iraq war after 9-11, and that just wreaked havoc on all relations in the Middle East. The Palestinians took a back seat to so many other things going on with the U.S. just blatantly murdering people in Iraq and Afghanistan. The Palestinian struggle was not getting nearly as much attention as it could, and Israel took advantage of this. And so Hamas was emboldened, and in 2005, uh, they, well, they were gaining power, eventually gaining power in 2006, um, 2007. I, th I think I made it, I don't know if I made it clear earlier, that they only expelled Fatah after 2007. I don't think, I think I earlier made it seem as though it happened after they were created, but that's not, that's not true. I'm sorry if I misguided you. Hamas would only expel Fatah. The, the same story applies, but it was after they were elected in 2007, not after they formed themselves in the late 80s. I hope that was clear. I don't know if I misled you. So in 2005, as obviously tensions were simmering, rising in Gaza, Israel pulled out of the Gaza Strip, which certain prominent uh, Zionists have really celebrated as like, look and see. This is one of the popular talking points. Look at what happened. Israel pulled out of Gaza and then it fell to absolute disarray when under Hamas's rule, it turned into a terrorist entity and terrorist enclave. Uh, so, yeah, this is what would happen if we pulled out of the West Bank. But this, it's like the most, it's the most absurd argument for so many reasons. Firstly, it completely ignores the history of occupation that put people in this horrible situation in the Gaza Strip for decades after years of having their territory encroached upon and taken from them. And then suddenly Israel's like, oh yeah, we'll just uh, remove ourselves. And then, oh look, it's all horrible. This is how we should justify then setting up a huge wall around it, making sure that we have complete control over every single border crossing except the one that goes into Egypt. And then they're able to say, look, 
uh, we aren't there anymore. We're just on the outside of it with machine guns, making sure that no one can come in or out of it unless it is approved by us, which is a crime, an international crime that you cannot limit how people move in or, in or out of their territory. Uh, a, a foreign state can't do that. So essentially, Israel was able to get around the claims that they were breaking occupation laws when they pulled out of Gaza. They were like, oh, well, we aren't there anymore. They just put their machine guns and military people all around it as though that's any better. Now, under occupation law, Israel could only use police, right? They could only, that was the, the primary thing is that the presence there, as far as any military goes, is, is limited to police. But by taking themselves out, they were able to then set up their military installations all around it. And as the Nuremberg Tribunal and Yugoslavia uh, Tribunal show, or how they argued, a place is occupied not when there is necessarily an invading army in it, controlling it. Occupation also applies to situations where an army can is is in a sit in, is in a position that they could overtake a territory or a country or whatever very swiftly with no resistance or very little resistance relative to the invading force so accepting that definition gaza was still being occupied but of course israel wasn't going to accept that in the us of course so israel still retained they claimed to have pulled out but they still retained control over Gaza's airspace, their seaports, their telecommunications network, their tax system, and, like I said, the four to five border crossings. And this is true. I mean, I know people who, who used to work or work for the uh, Freedom Flotilla many years ago uh, learning about this. And people I know who would, they would sail a ship from North America. It depends. There are different Freedom Flotilla ships, but the one that they were on went from North America up to Greenland and Iceland and then down through Europe to bring medical supplies ultimately into Gaza. They, they would be repeatedly arrested, brutalized by the IDF that doesn't allow any ships to enter into Gaza, which is like, oh, really? You're going to claim as though you just left the area? Like you, it's been liberated? Like, come on, this is a joke. So in 2006... Uh, when Hamas gained power, they cast out Fatah, which was actually trying to organize a U.S.-backed coup against Hamas. They failed, and Hamas then assumed total control over Gaza, which I, I total control, I put in you know quotation marks. Israel still held total control, but Hamas was the governing body there. Now, around the same time, Israel put forward a proposal to elevate the value of Israeli military lives above those of Palestinian civilian lives, giving them more cause to murder Palestinian civilians, especially in Gaza. Which goes against everything. I mean, as far as the rung of the value of lives go, the idea within any kind of democratic system where people can uh, choose to enlist, it's that military lives are technically worth the less, the less, worth the least of anyone else. These are people who sign up, and this is why they are commemorated for their bravery in the US and Canada. They sign up because they are telling everyone else that they are willing to put their life on the line for that state. So when Israel pulls this kind of nonsense and says that their military lives are more important or more valuable than the lives of Palestinian civilians who are not signing up for war, who did not choose to go into war, who are people who are living under occupation. I mean, this is just a sick, disgusting, depraved strategy to justify their slaughter. And Erkat the Brilliant uh, presents one quote by one soldier who says that anyone within 200 meters of a tank is dead on the spot. Doesn't matter who they are. Doesn't matter. Because he said, he was like, anyone within 200 meters of a tank is obviously just a terrorist. Uh, they're, they're there for no good reason. And so they're 200 meters. That's a long distance. Like, especially in heavily urbanized, dense uh, areas within Gaza, there's it's just absolutely disgusting the way that they justify this. Or as we find in that military person from 
recounted in Edward Said's uh, The Question of Palestine, who was like, every single Arab is a possible threat, and therefore they're all a target, because you never can know if an Arabic person is going to attack you, which is part of the Israeli military strategy, is just to strike first, ask questions later. So the Hannibal Directive, you know, hints of it, or at least ideas floating around back in the day, but it really came into effect in 2014 when they believed, when, the, when Israel believed uh, that one of their second lieutenants had actually been kidnapped in Rafa, Rafa very much in the news now because of Israel's relentless slaughter of people cowering in fear uh, and desperately clinging on to any moment of life that they have remaining uh, and Israel very, very willingly murdering them. Or, you know, you have the Israelis who are sitting on the border trying to deny any supplies going into Israel, uh, going into Gaza, you know, standard stuff. So in 2014, Israel believed that um, that a second lieutenant was being held hostage. He wasn't. And so in response, they killed nearly 200 Palestinians for nothing because they didn't want to enter into a hostage situation after they remember the horrible hostage situation from that police officer more than a decade before. So they knew that the best way to deal with this is just kill as many Palestinians as they can to avoid a hostage situation, even if it means injuring their own people. And we saw that the other day when Israel murdered more than 200 Palestinians to free four of their hostages and, maybe I'm wrong, murdered, I think, even a couple of their own people to get their hostages out just to avoid having hostage nego negotiations, which is, un it's absolutely horrendous. You spend any time on X, or what used to be known as Twitter, and you see all these Zionists screaming about how that actually wasn't enough. That it's, it has to be the most horrendous, the most horrendous stuff you're seeing, uh, we're seeing now. And of these 200 that were murdered, I mean, however many children, it, absolutely horrifying. But in 2014, when the 200 were murdered then, to ostensibly save, they ended up killing their own person, the second lieutenant, 55 of which a quarter were children. And this is consistent since October 7th. It's consistent across all of Israel's violent actions, the violence it inflicts against Palestinians, about a quarter of its victims are children, which who are innocent. All children are innocent, Like, but that... that, that that isn't enough for them. And then in another sick, twisted uh, strategy, because Israel doesn't really recognize Hamas's autonomy, it still recognizes that Hamas is a governing body, even if it doesn't recognize the body over which it is governing. And so Israel then designates anyone who works in the public sector in Gaza as being a terrorist because they're part of Hamas and being therefore uh, a target to kill. And this is exactly what happened in 2008. This is unbelievable. In 2008, 200 Palestinian police officers, prospective police officers, were at their graduation ceremony when Israel just started bombing them. Bombing them. These were innocent people, but this was part of the preemptive strategy to say, and this is how they justified it, oh, well, eventually they're going to be part of Hamas's military. And so therefore they will be a threat. So they murdered 200 people and their families. And by and then this launched a larger series of bombardments all across Gaza, murdering 1,400 people. And if we follow, I mean, we just got to follow the Israeli logic then. If Israel is allowed to go in and murder 1,400 people, just like they claimed Hamas did on October 7th, then that means, and we're just being consistent here, that the international community... The U.S. should be totally fine with Hamas going into Israel and murdering more than 40,000 people because that's part of the Israeli handbook. I mean, Israel is doing it. Why can't Hamas do it? At least we're being consistent here. And how many Israelis died in 2008 here after a month or so of Israel killing 1,400 people, including 300 kids? How many dead Israelis? Nine. Tragic. Horrible. No one's diminishing that. Three of whom were civilians. If, if there's a world where someone can at all find, suggest that these numbers are congruent with one another, 
that as though this isn't a disproportionate response? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think that you'll need some moral rearranging because there's something going on there. So Israel submits to the belief that all Gazans are threats. And when, uh, when it murders them, it claims Hamas held them all as human shields. This is super common. But again, really, Israel is the one using human shields. They arm their civilians in their kibbutzes, in various neighboring neighborhoods around Gaza. They're armed deliberately because Israel knows that that is the first line of defense against a possible attack. Israel also places its military installations in and around civilian areas, making them all viable targets, as Israel loves to say about Hamas. And we're just being consistent here. We're just being rational. We're being these good classic liberals like uh, Bill Maher, the coward, likes to say. And this human shields thing, I mean, no one, no one with any kind of moral alignment actually believes this. But just to emphasize just how sick and twisted it is, in 2014, uh, they, they really continued their, their onslaught and depravity by targeting a UN building sheltering refugees because, and I quote, a militant on a motorcycle traveled by the UN school. Israel defended itself by saying that the militant was using the people in that school that it had bombed as human shields. So this is just to give you a little bit of a history of this use of the term human shields. It also happens to dovetail with broader Orientalist themes of treating Arabic-speaking people in the Muslim world as somehow being these ultimate evil, having no care for humanity at all type, type figures which fits into the Israeli narrative and its attachment to the West in its use of force against Palestinians. Now, this was all, in 2014, part of what was called Operation Defensive Shield, where Israel killed 2,200 Palestinians. Like, these numbers are unfathomable. 22, and you didn't hear a word about this. I didn't. I didn't. Like... Anyone who is suddenly so upset about protesters, you know, those people on X who are just losing their minds about protesters or losing their minds about, I don't even know what, some petty nonsense that it's like, where were you when Israel was slaughtering all of these Palestinians? Where were you advocating for uh, ending the occupation then? Why is it that you only decide to speak up to discredit the Palestinian cause? Very interesting those people do that. And this is found throughout any, any wartime conflict, any genocide. There are always those people who are going to work to deflect away from the genocide, work to deflect away from the violence, and to therefore perpetuate it. And in all of this, Hamas is made out to be this extremist evil entity. But if you compare the numbers, the only extremist here is Israel and the U.S. And it, we're just being rational here. We compare the evils committed. And compared to Israel, Hamas is a moderate force. Definitely. Like, there's no comparison at all when you compare the number of deaths. And so Hamas was uh, Hamas was criticized not only by Israel and the U.S., by Fatah, who was being backed by the U.S., also Egypt. Egypt was no fan of, the, of Hamas because Hamas was extremely, uh, Hamas is extremely religious in their uh, Islamic resistance movement, whereas Egypt was less so. And then the Saudis view Hamas as just an Iran proxy intent on destabilizing the Middle East, because Hamas is no fan of Saudi Arabia, thinking that they're totally corrupt uh, in many other things, and having control over Mecca. But part, and I, I don't, I mean, I'm no, I'm no expert on Muslim resistance in the Muslim world, but uh, in any case, as far as I know, like knowing about Islamic Jihad across uh, the Muslim world is that one of its precepts is to focus on the local struggle against their immediate government. That's, that's the main goal. And so Muslims organized in their resistance to oppression are doing so as, as part of the Islamic Jihad focus primarily on their own objectives and don't get as involved. I'm not speaking on behalf of all of them or it's just this homogenous movement, but generally stay focused on their immediate situation 
and not in the situation of others dealing with their own things, dealing with their own things. What a way to diminish that, David, um, in their own struggle for freedom. But again, I'm not an expert on that. I'm not an expert on that. It's very limited knowledge I have about that. And in all of this, of course, as we've said, UN, uh, Israel just opposes and resists the UN and ICC. They choose to investigate themselves. Really horrendous stuff. Israel uses these conflicts, especially the conflicts between Hamas and other Arab nations, other Arab states, to say, like, look, no one likes Hamas. Therefore, we are justified in murdering everybody. Like, horrendous. And she concludes by stressing Israel's being an apartheid regime. And yeah, that, that concludes up the kind of bulk of it here. We'll move into the conclusion. Just to, So let's move in here to just the short conclusion to wrap this up. So as of 2015, there were over 600,000 illegal settlers in the West Bank, allotting Palestinian territory into or reducing it to 20 non-contiguous so Palestinian territory actually uh, held by Palestinians within the West Bank is a bunch of little blots that aren't connected, which makes it really difficult to actually move people around, especially if you're going to mount any kind of military uh, struggle or resistance to the occupation. Israel has set up their wall to separate them from and to separate settlers from Palestinians that they all they brand as all being a threat. Uh, Israel essentially just controls from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River. So people lose their minds when uh, protesters take to the streets and yell from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. But they have no problem when Israel holds all that land and the amount of bloodshed that they have uh, done, committed, to attain all that land. Then suddenly from the river to the sea is totally fine. 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 Totally fine. Now, for those of you that have made it this far, I want to read a little summary that Eric Hat the Brilliant gives us here, just, you know, as an overview of the main points. So following the First World War, a sovereign exception marking Palestine as a site of Jewish settlement engendered a specialized legal arrangement that justified the juridical erasure of a Palestinian political community. This regime together with three decades of British imperial sponsorship, enabled Israel to assert its Jewish Zionist settler sovereignty by, over, by force over 78% of Mandate Palestine in 1948. Israel used the fiction of Palestinian national non-existence together with the structure of permanent emergency between 1948 and 1966 to transform its native Palestinian population into present absent individuals whose lands could be arbitrarily confiscated for Jewish settlement. When it terminated its emergency regime, Israel enshrined the subordination of Palestinians as second-class citizens in civil law. In 1967, Israel deployed a legal political mechanism also predicated upon Palestinian national non-existence to establish an occupation premised on sui generis claims to facilitate its steady land grab within the West Bank and Gaza. The Oslo Accords framework established in 1993 engendered yet another specialized regime that has enabled Israel to continue its settler colonial expansion, this time under the veneer of peacemaking. Since 2000, also in accord with similar claims of unique distinction, Israel has criminalized all Palestinian use of force. At the same time, the state has expanded its right to use force against Palestinians and in the process has forged new laws of armed conflict. And I think that that's just a brilliant summary, very short, you know, it doesn't get into all the nuance of everything we've covered, everything that Erekat the Brilliant has given us here to understand this history and Israel's violence against Palestine and Palestinians. So Israelis place Palestinians under apartheid because if they didn't, they know they'd be outnumbered and lose every free election. So you can't help but feel like the end goal is to encroach upon Palestinian territory to get Palestinians to move away from Palestine, to just expel them from their own land, have them die, push them to the brink of having to then resist, and then use disproportionate force to murder many of them to the point that Palestine and Palestinians no longer exist. That seems to be the Zionist dream here, still being played out. 
And so essentially, Israel is placing Palestinians in concentrated ghettos. That sound familiar? Between 1967 and 1994, beyond displacing and murdering, Israel renounced and removed 10% of Palestinians' residency permits, taking away their residency. Hmm, sound familiar? There have, often, there have also been many issues with Palestinian leadership capitulating to Israel's demands, and th this really hasn't been helpful either. They've been Israel's lapdogs since the early 90s, helping to police Palestinians. So, like, they set up and find local leaders who happen to be uh, supportive of Israel, and then fund them, use them to uh, mount police pressure and to set up a police state in Palestinian territory. In, in or in all, all Palestinian territory. So obviously a Palestinian state would be great, somewhat, but we must be wary of the politics of recognition if it isn't accompanied with material advantages. So the politics of recognition is referring back to Glenn Coulthard's work in Red Skin, White Masks, when he says that we need to be very careful, and occupied people and colonized people need to be very careful of the ways in which their colonizer will give them just minimal type of recognition in exchange for their submission to that colonial power. So we can't forget as well that Trump moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem in 2017, making it apparent how the U.S. really views the Palestinian struggle. Trump just did what it seems like every other president wanted to do, revealing that the U.S. ultimately, the U.S.'s view of Palestine is not a good one. The UN obviously disagreed, but the US vetoed the condemnation and threatened to cut UNRWA funding. Sound familiar? Should Palestinians not return to negotiate peace with Israel? Which really means negotiate how much land and power to lose. That has historically been the case. Going to the table with Israel for Palestinians means that they'll lose more. So what to do? What to do? Well, Palestinian Authority needs to get uh, the legal work done and they should use South Africa uh, and their subjugation of uh, and the subjugation of uh, Namibia as case studies to understand the apartheid regime that they are living under. The Palestinians also need to abandon what is called the U.S. sphere of influence, those uh, Arab countries in the in the region that are supportive of the U.S. Pal Palestinians have to distance themselves from them, and a lot of this stuff is antiquated. Like, uh, of course, this is a few. This came out in 2019. So a few years ago, I think a lot of th a lot has changed since then. But in any case, I think that the prescriptions are still useful. She thinks that armed struggle is necessary, but not sufficient on its own. Obviously, armed struggle can only do so much on its own. Hamas has made developments for Palestine in its resistance to Israel. Since October 7th, though, in El well, this is just me or my point. Since October 7th, uh, it is elevated Hamas has been successful at elevating global consciousness about the injustices. It has raised global consciousness. Many new nations in the West have now recognized uh, Palestinian statehood. And just think of yourself, if you're still listening to this, how much more you know about this since October 7th. They've also encouraged uh, many states to cut ties with Israel, diplomatic, economic ties, and so on. Elsewhere, um, uh, Boycott, divestment, sanctions have proved very effective. And that's the kind of pressure that people outside of Palestine can be doing in pressuring their political leaders, uh, corporate leaders, and so on. Can't forget, like, and this is really her concluding point, one of her concluding points is that Palestinians are not the only ones to suffer at the hands of Zionists. Zionism wasn't good for Middle Eastern Jews either who didn't share the same culture and language and beliefs as many European Jews that were arriving. All of those European Jews didn't share all of their own language and beliefs and ideas or anything. And so Zionism, the way that it victimizes people in its national aspirations, is just, it's, it's horrendous. But yeah, and that concludes this. I hope that it was informative. If there's anything I got wrong, Anything that I omitted, I'd love to hear about it. I re really recommend you read the book. There's just so much more detail in it. Obviously, I can only cover so much. But yeah, yeah. Uh, on that note, consider organizing and getting involved where you can. And uh, yeah, see you later. Take care.